the Numinous Podcast with Carmen Spaniola. Hi there, and welcome to the Numinous Podcast, where we have interesting conversations with everyday folks about the mystery of life. I'm your host, Carmen Spaniola, joining you from the lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. It's also known as Victoria, BC, Canada. Today's episode is slightly different. It's a rebroadcast of a very special event I had the honor of attending earlier in 2021. It was the release of my dear friend Taryn A. Erfan King's wonderful book, Conscious Grieving, The Path of Awakening Through Loss. Taryn A. is a registered counselor with a specialty in expressive arts and a broad background in psychology, body-centered practices, and mysticism, including her hereditary lineage of Sufism. Born in Iran, she immigrated to Canada as a child with her family and has lived and worked in several parts of the world, including Guyana, France, Switzerland, Tanzania, and Sri Lanka. This book includes original poetry and prayers that are arrestingly, staggeringly beautiful. I'm choking up just remembering them. I was literally crying by page 14. Because the prayers and poems are just, oh, they are arrows that pierce deeply. If you know grief, Taranay will let you know that she knows your grief. The whole rest of the way through the book felt like a gentle yet very cathartic release. I was asked to interview Taranay as part of her online book launch event, and it really warms my heart to travel back in time to that special night with her friends and family and many clients and early readers gathered. I'm pleased to share that conversation with you now. So Tarane, what identities do you lead with? Hmm. It's such a um, unique question for someone who is mostly (laughs) spirit-led. So I guess the first identity is spirit. Um, I also happen to embody the role of a mother and daughter and therapist and friend. Embodied soul, I guess. (laughs) That's aspirational identity. Thank you. (laughs) Put that on my uh, email signature. (laughs) So Yeah, I've had a chance to read the book. I got to read an advanced copy and I was crying by page 14. The the poems and prayers uh, are really um, gripping and very touching. So it makes me wonder, um, who were you thinking of when you wrote this book? You know, it's, it's very personal. So was there an earlier version of you or someone out there that you were writing to? Who did you have in mind? That's a great question because the book came together in these beautiful waves. And I didn't even recognize them as one ocean until the book was almost near its completion. So I started writing um, poetry about grief. Um, Actually, originally, two close friends of mine, you will probably (laughs) self-identify because you're here, um, both lost their fathers um, several years ago. And I realized that I didn't know how to support these friends all that well. well at a distance especially, or in the best way that I wanted to. Um, All words seemed to fail me. And I noticed that I continued to send pieces of poetry to them, or when I would think about them and I would send something to them, it would be quite poetic. And so I realized at that time that maybe poetry was a, a beautiful container for some of these tremendously deep and complex emotions that come along with grief. And so initially I started writing those. And then when my maternal grandmother passed, 
um, I again turned to poetry because she was a poet herself and she was a, I'm not even sure if she ever really knew before she passed what a tremendous teacher of mine she was. Um, but I started to write poetry and then I started to write these adjacent prayers to support me in my process of grieving her loss. Because um, as I say in the book, I always thought that as a spiritual person, I would be able to deal with grief when it came knocking on my door pretty easily. Um, I thought like I sincerely know and believe that we are spirits embodied. And so when life in this form ends, um, we are not disconnected from our loved ones. And yet when she passed, I lost myself and I um, had a really hard time. And it was in the process of writing the prayer pieces adjacent to the poems that I found some healing and some remembrance of that deeper holding that spirit can and always does have for us in our times of deep sorrow. And so I had been working on basically this book of poetry about grief for some time. And I had been working on a totally separate book about conscious living. Um, and then one day I woke up with the clarity that these were actually two sides of the same book. They were not two separate books, that um, they were in fact saying the same thing, that moving into a conscious life allows for all human experiences to be hmm, felt completely, but also not attached to from the place of ego. And so once I had that knowing, the book had to be written. And I don't know that I had one person in mind. And I don't know even if it was just for myself or some version of myself, but it was for people perhaps like myself who have or know of this connection to a greater essence that goes beyond the egoic frame of reference. They have that, but they're also human because we are, we came in this form and life will rattle us. Maybe not the Dalai Lama, I'm not sure. Hopefully I will have the pleasure of speaking with him one day, but for now I have not yet met another individual who no matter how consciously they live, don't get derailed from time to time from their human experience. So the book was written with that knowing that it's for someone who already has that sense of there is something bigger, uh, although the book is not dogmatic in any way or religious in any way, um, but also knows that doing the human stuff is fucking hard sometimes. Um, whether that's personally or in our communities, um, whether it's us who's feeling the grief or we're holding space for the grief of others. So whether if you're, if you're a therapist like me or like you, or if you're um, a facilitator, if you're a nurse or a doctor or a care provider for your elderly parents or for your young child or whatever, there's so many types of grief. And although this book, um, perhaps the focus is on supporting people who are grieving the loss of an individual, the messages in it are applicable to any kind of grief, whether that grief is of a personal nature, a collective nature, um, whether it is about the loss of an individual, perhaps it's about the loss of an identity of the self um, or um, grieving who we thought we were or who we used to be or who we long to be and all of those things. So mm. that was a very long winded answer. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said some really key words, you know, there's depth and complexity and also holding 
And mm -hmm. I wonder what you think though, is there a, a type or a scale of grief that is just too much for humans? You know, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking now of, um, you know, when you hear the news of um, a Dante Wright or George Floyd, somebody like that, um, another black man killed by the police. If, when you hear about um, nine people slayed or injured from anti-Asian hate in Atlanta. You, I mean, when we think about the legacies and histories of white supremacy, colonialism, um, imperialism, do you think there's a scale at which humans just like can't do that much grief? How, how do you, what do you think about collective grief? Given obviously positionality and all of that. But, yeah. Okay, I think two things are coming. Well, two things, but they're coming way too fast. One, the first one is, um, is there such a such a grief that is too huge a burden for humans to experience, basically? And the answer is yes. But thank God we're not just human. We're human beings. Our being is our essence, it's our soul. It's the part that if we allow it to lead can lead us to healing. Yes, there are certain griefs that just the human part of us cannot handle. It's not meant to. It doesn't know. It doesn't know, it doesn't trust. It doesn't, it's not as held, it is form for a reason. It's meant to think and feel and try to make sense. It's its job, you know? That's that human aspect of us. But our essence, that being part of us, that part that is the seer behind the veil, that part knows. And I think that it's that part that can come to support us in times of such tremendous grief, uh, particularly in community and in collective aspects of grief, where even aside from specifics, you know, and without being too esoteric and spiritually bypassing the truth of the human experience, that spirit part can come and lead the human experience into a conscious state of being. So it's not all, um, well, we are one. So when I, they feel pain, I feel pain and I'm really grieving. It's like, no, that's still ego talking. And that is spiritual bypassing. So the part of us that already knows has no song and dance about it. It just shows up. It just shows up in the space between things, in the space between words. It's not about the post you make or the right thing that you say. It's about your beingness and how you are with people that holds the community and can hold that grief with community. Because in that place, we aren't separate. So we do feel that immense pain on that level because it's an, it's an extension of ourselves and we understand it as such, and therefore we address it as such. It's never, and um, well, this community is grieving or this community is grieving or some blanket statement of, well, we're all grieving. Yes, we're all grieving, but we're all experiencing it in our human aspect quite differently. So to show up fully and entirely and honestly for the greater community, we need to bring the conscious part, the being part, and the human part, and bring them hand in hand, and let that be the holding. Another long answer for you. No, I mean, <laughs> that, that is about as concise as you can distill such a huge question. Like, let's start with some soft ones here, Taryn. How do we deal with <laughs> Alexa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. 
good laugh. What, what, where, where is the room then for joy in grieving? Because what about respect for the dead? What about respect for other mourners? Like, oh it feels, um, you know, when, when grief can be like a, a tsunami that's come at you, it's, it's, it's so much. Sometimes it would be nice just to come up for air. How do you know when you're actually distancing yourself from the truth and when you're actually resourcing yourself with joy? And then how do we bring that in community? Just, you know, mm-hmm. quick answer, please. <laughs> oh, I'm just joking. <laughs> Shake all That's not really like. It's so good. It's so good because honestly too, because I'm in this place where, you know, I meet people and I'm talking about how I've published a book and they go, what's your book about? And I go, it's a book about grieving. And they go, oh, that's usually, I think most people have a shitty poker face. Uh, Most people are like, oh, wow, so intense. Who is this person? Get me the fuck out of here. That's what most people are like. Um, because I think most people are quite, um, I, my sense is that they're like, either you're super intense, no thank you very much, or I'm super uncomfortable with grieving, no thank you very much, or you must be a super depresso, I don't want to hang out with you. <laughs> and um, what I have experienced in my, perhaps in my personal life, but also as a therapist, is that um, I often say this, like joy is a superpower. And I'm not talking about superficial happiness and I'm not talking about distraction. I'm talking about your essence as joy. I'm talking about um, I'm talking about that knowing that is beyond the mind and beyond the emotions, that, that deeper holding, that it has a clarity of ease and peace and restfulness, and there we can find joy. And in times of grief, allowing joy in can be the lifeline that pulls us through. Um, you know, some of you may have listened to the talk or started reading the book, but um, the first time I experienced quite uh, an extreme experience of grief was um, when I had gone to Guyana at the age of 19 and I'd lived there for the, for three months or so. Um, And I had been faced with this reality of um, how many people were dying in these small communities of HIV and AIDS, there was, I guess, like a, a, a pandemic of sorts due to um, lack of resources and education. And when I came back to Vancouver, I was so overcome by sorrow that I think for nine months, um, I didn't even know or couldn't feel joy. I felt like I had no access to it. And I dampened it when I felt it because I felt so um, guilty for experiencing any, any happiness when there was so much grief and unhappiness in the world and so much injustice in the world. Um, and what I realized is that if I didn't allow the peace and ease and joy that is, that wants to live through me to come to my rescue, I could have stayed in that sorrow for all of time because the world is a beautiful place, but it's also a dark and totally shitty place also. And if I hold the sorrow, I have to hold the joy too. If the world is full of sorrow, it has to be full of joy too. There's beauty and there's pain. So there must also be joy where there is deep sorrow. And the deeper experiences of sorrow I've had, the deeper experiences of joy I've had also. 
And I, because I have learned not to cling to either one for, okay, now I'm a super depresso or now I'm super like jazz hands all the time. I'm not, I'm just a human being who allows for both of those experiences to move through me. Um, and they deepen me as an individual so that I can hold that space for other people. If I didn't allow joy to come to my rescue once in a while, I wouldn't be able to be who I am for the people who I'm who I am for, for them, <laughs> right? Mm. Um, and so I think when we look at the complexity of the world that we live in, the depth of the um, racial injustices that are going on, certainly in the United States, but here in Canada too. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. In, in all over the world, there are injustices occurring and then you layer uh, gender on that and then you layer sexual orientation on that and then you um, layer um, the body and the body's expression on that. There's, there are so many layers there. And so there can be days that I get extremely sorrowful about the state of the world. Um, but I also know that for those of us who have access to the joy, if we allow the joy to come in, to boost us just for a little bit so that we can do good work in the world. We can move the needle just a little because there will be a time that I will be in sorrow and I will lean on my community. And so I hope, I sincerely hope that um, People in all communities, when they feel deep sorrow, they also allow space for joy. I mentioned in the book that one of my earliest memories is, and, and this is a memory that my parents also talked about often, is of when I was really young and we lived in Iran and the Iran-Iraq war was happening and there were bombings, daily bombings, and my parents because they didn't want us to live in fear and be worried about the sound of the aircrafts overhead, uh, would pick up the, the sitar or the guitar and what was just available and they would strum and they would sing. And yes, there was a part of them that was living in fear and in sorrow, in deep grief day to day, but there was also joy and love there. And I think that that's what um, laid the foundation for my ability to hold both. So I owe that to my parents for sure. Looking at you, Mama. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> so one of the things about grief is it can feel so lonely, especially when your grief is taboo outside of social norms. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about folks who, you know, have ambivalence. Let's say somebody dies that you're really angry at or somebody that was close to you who hurt you, you know? And so you have both this sense of perhaps a desire for closure, a desire to honor some of the good things, but also, not wanting to subsume or deny your own self, these can be very complicated things to grieve. <laughs> and so I'm wondering what your thoughts might be on that. I, I imagine that's a pretty niche book to write. <laughs> and so most yeah. books on grief and are gonna be kind of more general, but what about those yeah. sticky situations? Okay, hold that thought. 
sticky situation, low battery moment on my computer. Okay. That's <laughs> We're live, people. Sorry. Jazz hands. And now the guy with the spinning plates. Okay, we're good, we're good. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, people who we have complicated relationships with and perhaps even um, difficult ones, traumatic ones, unhealed ones will die and we will feel an enormous amount of complexity around that passing. We will feel confused when we are sad. Uh, we will feel righteous when we feel angry and then guilty for not having perhaps smoothed some things over. We might be wishing for things to have been different knowing that perhaps they couldn't have been, but perhaps they could have, if only we had, et cetera. I wish that there was a simple answer, but we are complicated humans and the digestion of each nuance is also complicated. Not impossible, but nuanced to each person's unique way of having embodied those particular layers of experience with the person who's passed. So if you're someone who's here or someone who listens to this podcast at a later date and you go, yeah, I had a complicated relationship with someone or perhaps I have a complicated relationship with someone and I know that either I need to heal something with them before they pass or else, you know, cause, cause this is also part of it. Like the, the end of this form is inevitable whatever you might want to think about it it's inevitable like whether it's us or someone else it will happen and so if you're someone who has complexity around relationships and feelings of let's just say unhealed or yet to be healed parts Soften, just soften. Mm. I can't give you a blanket statement for what can help heal that difficulty, what can smooth those rough edges of the things they said and the things you wish they hadn't said and the things you said and the things you wish you hadn't said. We cannot smooth those over with a blank slate, but we can soften in holding them. We can let perhaps just a little bit of love in for ourselves or for the other person. Hold each other with some gentleness. Hold ourselves with some gentleness, especially when anger arises. So you've spoken really tenderly and sensitively about other people's grief. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share with us what you're grieving now, Karen A. Honestly, honestly, this, these days I find myself, um, in the complexity of the grief that is the constraint of the human form and society. <laughs> I know that sounds very esoteric. You know, like, what is she saying?
I find that being someone who is spirit led, sometimes it's really hard to human. It's really hard to um, human when I see the world so differently than most people that I know. Um, so I think there's a part of me that grieves my need to stay constrained uh, in some way so that I am understood and digestible by society and even by my community. Um, I think there's some grief in that because then I wonder about how many other millions of people experience life the way that I do and what kind of magical shift we could make happen if we weren't so boxed in. Mm. So that's, uh, that's the truth of what I'm personally grieving at a, at a, deep, <laughs> at a deep level. Um, and then on a very like human level, because still human, still right here. Um, you know, I, um, the majority of my clients are people who identify um, as people of color, um, probably 90% or so. And uh, more than 50% of them also uh, fall outside of gender norms and identities. And I grieve with them because there's a lot of difficult things that they're experiencing. And I feel them so deeply and I love them so deeply. And so often I'm like, oh, if only I had that magic wand, you know? Mm -hmm. So there is, there is a little bit of um, that collective grief that I experience every day. It's not anything that I ever turn off or, um, and not that I would want to, but it's just very present all the time from many, many, many different angles and identities and um, space holding. And actually I'm pretty grateful for it. I'm pretty grateful. For it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being so present with us. I really appreciate all the wisdom that you've shared tonight. Taranay's book, Conscious Grieving, is available at online major retailers, of course, but it would be so awesome if you'd ask your local bookseller to stock it, because it's such a useful book, especially as a gift to any griever that you know. I would just love to think of people walking through the bookstore and seeing the title and going, oh, that's what I need right now. This book is, it's more a compassionate companion than a how-to book, and as you've just heard, this is a companion you want to be friends with, especially when you're grieving. Um, just Taranay is just such a phenomenal human, and I wish her all the love and success in the world. So it's listener shout-out segment time. As long-time listeners know, I like to look in my unique downloads each week to see where my listeners are. And typically, you know, like I know that the coasts are going to be big fans of the show. You know, it's... it's uh, San Francisco, it's New York, it's Seattle, it's, um, you know, it, it, so week in and week out. And I, and I love you all, coastal people. I, I totally appreciate, appreciate you um, hanging in with me, you know. But I can't help but notice when some place is, like, not listening. Like, it's very obvious because it stands out like a sore thumb. It's the only place that isn't, like, lit up in color, just blank. So I'm looking at North Dakota, like, so, of course, I, you know, I can talk about them because they're not listening. What the hell is going on in North Dakota? Am I banned there? Like, I don't, is it, do you have, 
Apple Podcasts, what is happening? What have I done or said? Like, how how do I have listeners in Latvia or um, Croatia or, you know, looking at the map here, Ethiopia? Like, okay, yes, I look at the world. Uganda, I'm going to give you a pass. But North Dakota, I don't even want them to listen now. Anyway, I would like to show some love to Texas. Just always a pleasant surprise to see how much love there is for the Numinous Podcast in Texas. Thank you for listening. And specifically, shout out to Jen G down there and her partner Jeff in Texas, sending you lots of love. Thanks for listening. And then over to New Mexico, I want to send love to my podcast super fan, Marissa. Thank you for all your support over such a long time. If you'd like to stay connected, you can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Spaniola or go to my website to find out how you can access nearly all of my current offerings, all my courses, my live uh, weekly group somatic practices, my monthly um, intuition development courses, my seasonal wheel of the year workshops, all for one low monthly membership in the Numinous Network. You'll find all the details at carmenspaniola.com, C-A-R-M-E-N-S-P-A-G-N-O-L-A. Until next time, take care.